Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study some of the best stories from all the Old Testament. I love some of the stories that happen in Daniel chapters 1 through 6. Where we're headed with this, maybe some highlights, is we will talk about the prophecy of the church, that it is like a stone that's cut out of a mountain without hands. And we're going to talk about the phrase of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but if not. And this is one of my favorite teachings, one of my favorite stories in all the Old Testament. And then also, the writing is on the wall. We start off, Daniel is set in, the, in Babylon. Bab he enters Babylon about 605 BC. His name means God as judge. The book of Daniel is divided into two parts. The Come Follow Me curriculum focuses on chapters 1 through 6, has mostly storylines, okay, a couple visions. And chapters 7 through 12 is a lot more visions, dreams, and maybe how that applies to prophecies of the latter days. In its current form, the book of Daniel was created in about 530 BC. Daniel, when he gets to Babylon, they decided they don't like these Hebrew names. They're going to change the name to the way they want them to. So Daniel, who was called Daniel, meaning God is my judge, became Belshazzar. Oh, protect his life. They go from a Jewish God-centered name to, okay, more of a Babylonian name. Haniah, or God is gracious, becomes his new name is Shadrach, or the great scribe. He's probably got some skills there. Mishael, who is what God is, now becomes the Babylonian name Meshach, or guest of a king. The last, Ariza, or God of, is my help, became known in Babylon as Abednego, or a servant of Negor. I would start off this by just, I mean, if I'm teaching like a class, I'd start off with the story of Walter Creed Haymond. You may recall years ago, Elder Elder Perry gave a story of Walter Creed Haymond. And kind of this background of it is that, and this comes from the Improvement Era, October 18 or 1928. He is an outstanding athlete at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a track runner. He becomes the captain of the team. The night before the meet is going to happen, his coach comes around with some wine. It's supposed to be a tonic. It's supposed to be, hey, this is going to help you. Gives it to him, the team. And he's at a dilemma. What do I do? And he tells the coach, I can't drink this. And the coach is kind of like, come on, you are the captain. Set an example. He says, I, I can't do it. Elder Perry continues with the story. The coach then left the captain of the team in a state of extreme anxiety. Suppose he made a poor showing tomorrow. What could he say to his coach? He was going up against the fastest men in the world. Nothing less than his best would do. His stubbornness might lose the meat for pen. His teammates were told what to do, and they had responded. There was only one reason. He had been taught all of his life to obey the word of wisdom. It was a crucial hour in this young man's life. With all the spiritual forces of his nature pressing in on him, he knelt down and earnestly asked the Lord to, for, to give him a testimony as the source of, of his, this revelation that he had believed in and obeyed. Then he went to his bed and slept in sound slumber. The next morning, the team members felt ill and performed poorly, except Brother Haymond, who won the 100 and 220 yard dashes. The team lost the meet, but their captain had astounded the fans with two excellent runs, Elder Perry said. At the end of that strange day, as Creed Haymond was going to bed, there suddenly came to his memory his question of the night before regarding the divinity of the word of wisdom. The sweet, simple assurance of the Spirit came to him. The word of wisdom is from God. And then if I'm teaching a class, I would just say, how does this relate to Daniel chapter 1? And just have them search Daniel chapter 1. So it's an idea of where they're going to the scriptures and searching how it relates. And, and you may know, as remember with Daniel chapter 1, Daniel comes and he's offered the meat of the king. And he is saying because of my religion, I cannot eat what is being given. And there are people, they, they speculate, here's why it is, maybe because of uh, anyway, different things, the aspects of the law of Moses. But for him, he says, I want to do something different. Now, if you want a video on this, I love what the church has done. They've produced one called God Gave Them Knowledge. You can get it on the church's website, 
at my website, brothermiller.org. I'll have this link with all my notes, just so you can easily go there. For Daniel, he says in verse 12, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Pulse is seeds and grains, like peas and wheat and barley and rye. Now, eating things like that is going to be healthy. It may make them a little more healthy. I think it probably make me more healthy. But they're also blessed for God by God for adhering to the laws that they were given. God blesses them and they made them healthier than those who ate the king's meat. So, uh, verse 13. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, the countenances of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which to eat the portion of the king's meat. And now, I realize that this is kind of a, a physical appearance. They look better. But more important to me is verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And I think that's part of what the blessing of the Word of Wisdom is today. I know some people who are pretty adherent to the Word of Wisdom, and they still have health challenges. But part of the blessing of the Word of Wisdom is God's going to bless you and help you with wisdom and understanding. For Daniel, and continuing with verse 17, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And skipping to verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in his realm. Daniel continued, even in the first year of King Cyrus. He seems to be in the court. He is one who is renowned for his understanding, his wisdom. He is blessed because he keeps the commandment of God. For Daniel, this is all about his covenant relationship with God, his relationship with God. He's doing what's right in God's sight, no matter what happens. And the end of verse 21, it's to the reign of King Cyrus. This King Cyrus is now 50 years later. So Daniel's in the king's court and respected for quite a long time. President Spencer W. Kimball gave a great summary of, this, of what happened to Daniel when he said, The gospel was Daniel's life. The word of wisdom was vital to him in the king's court. He could be little criticized. But even for a ruler, he would not drink the king's wine, nor gorge himself with meat and rich foods. His moderation and his purity of faith brought him health and wisdom and knowledge and skill and understanding, and his faith linked him closely to his Father in heaven, and revelations came to him as often as required. And maybe, you know, once again, if I'm teaching in class, I just say, all right, from this experience, from Brother Haman, from Daniel, from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, from his experiences, what can you learn from Daniel that can you apply to your life? And, you know, maybe if you're in a Sunday school class and they're my age, they'd be saying, I need to eat more healthy, <laughs> okay? Or maybe it is I need to be more obedient to the Lord so he can reveal his will to me. Help me understand revelation more. Help me understand my will for, for, for us better. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the second king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. He ruled from the death of his father, about 605 BC, to his own death in 562 BC, about 40-ish years, a little over 40 years. He is known as Nebuchadnezzar the Great. He is often seen as the empire's greatest king. And while he's a king, he has a dream. You may remember his dream in the second year of Daniel chapter 2. It was all about it. The second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherein his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call all the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. Now, these are people who are supposed to divine truth, who are supposed to have men of deep understanding. And a lot of it is maybe what you call the dark arts. They're trying to divine this dream through alternate means. And so they came and stood before the king. And I pause here before I read verse 3. And I just wonder, what would happen at the end of verse 1, after Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream, if Nebuchadnezzar would have maybe taken some cues from Daniel in chapter 1, where he had learned wisdom and stayed true, and he had learned that from God? How would things have changed if Nebuchadnezzar at this time would have said, I'm going to be like Daniel and ask God myself for an interpretation. 
it would have given Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity to have that relationship with God himself. Now, I know I'm just kind of speculating here, but sometimes I think we miss opportunities because we don't ask for them. I truly believe that what God said, what Christ has encouraged us to do, asking you shall, and you shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you, is valid for us too. Okay, back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 3. King said unto them, I've dreamed a dream. My spirit was troubled to know the dream. His desire is, hey, I want to know the dream. I want you to know the dream, interpret it, and come back to me. And in the dream, he sees a figure. Head of gold, got shoulders of silver. And as he starts to, this is the dream, his astrologers can't understand. They can't get the dream. They can't understand the dream. And they're a little frustrated. You've got to tell us the dream so we can understand it. And then Daniel's called before him. And I love Daniel's response in chapter 2, verse 19. Because he goes to God. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. I love what Daniel's saying here. If you want to be a little more wise, start by being wise today and ask God for more wisdom. Being wise is, is acting on your understanding, things you know would be true. It gives you wisdom. Find out something's true, act on it, become wise. The principle, I think, that's just being taught, one of them in, ver in verse 21 is, God builds on what we already know. He gives more wisdom to the wise because they're seeking it. Those people understand things. He builds on that knowledge. When you build on knowledge, it is related to you. Helps you in your understanding. Helps in your retention of memory. So Daniel's called upon. Hey, here's the dream. And once again, back to that video, God gave them knowledge from the church. I think it's a great little video. Uh, it not only shows Daniel by not eating the king's wine and the king's meat, but also shows this part of this vision. In the vision, there's an image or man in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And it was formed from various materials. Daniel gives an inspired interpretation found in verses 36 to verses 43. History and some modern day prophetic teachings help us understand what the kingdoms were, were represented by this image. So you go the head of gold, or fine gold, represents the Babylonian Empire. It's Nebuchadnezzar. Here's your empire. And you will be succeeded by, you got the arms uh, and breast of silver. The, there's two, the Mede and the Persian empires. And then you're succeeded. You got the belly and thighs of brass, which is the Macedonian empire. And then you got two legs. It's going to start off as one, divide into two. That is symbolic of the Roman empire. And then sooner or later, you get these, these feet and toes. They're mixed with iron and clay. And you got the ten toes. Well, they represent kingdoms that will arise after the fall of the Roman Empire. And those kingdoms have been identified. Because all that's going to happen, going to happen and be in the time when this stone is going to be cut out of the mountain. So, through modern day prophets, they have been identified that this, you got ten kingdoms in 1820 when God sets up the kingdom of God here on earth. And so I, I list 10 that, you know, modern day scholars and prophets have said, hey, here were 10 that were established in 1820 when Joseph Smith was called to be a prophet, when God sets up his kingdom in the last days. Here's the way Spencer W. Kimball summarizes it. He said, this is a revelation concerning the history of the world. When one world power would supersede another until there would be numerous smaller kingdoms to share control of the earth. And it was in the days of these kings that power would not be given to men. But the God of heaven would set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God upon the earth, which should never be destroyed nor left to other people. The Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints was restored in 1830 after numerous revelations from divine source. And this is the kingdom set up from the God of heaven that would never be destroyed nor superseded. The stone come out from the mountain without hands that would become great mountain and would fill the whole earth. No king or set of rulers could divine this history, but a young pure and worthy prophet could receive a revelation from God. There was a purpose in this unveiling of the history of the world, so that the honest in heart might be looking forward to its establishment 
and numerous good men and women, knowing of the revelations of God and the prospects for the future, have looked forward to this day. So we get verse chapter 2, verse 35. Here's the prophecy. Then the iron, the clay, brass, silver, and the gold, broken to pieces together, became like chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that was smote, the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. And then an inspired interpretation of verse 44. And the days of these kings, the ten, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest the stone that was cut of the mountains without hands, no man or woman did this. This is an act by God. And it break into pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, and the great God hath made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And then I love Daniel's, hey, this is a second witness. The dream is certain. I imagine, this is true. And the interpretation thereof, sure, I know it's true. And I just think, just thinking of our day, as the God has set forth, the, set up the kingdom in our day, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, think of all the events that have happened since 1820 to the establishment of the church in April 1830 on April 6th that's allowed Nebuchadnezzar's dream to come to pass and how the church has continually been built and built. In the days of Joseph Smith, they didn't see that vision. Wilfred Rudruff told them an experience of a meeting with the prophet Joseph Smith. And he's going to prophesy the church's growth. The meeting was in a small, perhaps a small house, perhaps 14 square feet, but it held the whole of the priesthood of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were then in the town of Kirtland, who had gathered together to go off in Zion's camp. Joseph Smith had asked the brethren to testify what they saw as the future of the church. Their vision did not extend as far as his. After several of the men had borne their testimonies of the work, the, bro the prophet said, Brethren, I've been very much edified and instructed in your testimonies here tonight, but I want to say to you before the Lord that you know no more concerning the destinies of the church and kingdom than a babe upon his mother's lap. You don't comprehend it. It is only a little handful of priesthood you see here tonight, but this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. And the rest of that quote I have here on the screen, it will not only fill the world, he adds on, it will fill the Rocky Mountains. There will be tens and thousands of Latter-day Saints who will be gathered in the Rocky Mountains. Modern-day prophets have referred to this prophecy, and they've also left their testimony. Let me just share one more with you. President Gordon Mee Hinckley said, And this is only the beginning. We have scarcely scratched the surface. We are engaged in a work for the souls of men and women everywhere. Our work knows no boundaries. Under the providence of the Lord, it will continue. Those nations now closed to us will someday be open. That is my faith. That is my belief. That is my testimony. The little stone which was cut out of the mountain without hands is rolling forth to fill the earth. I think it's a wonderful thing to be a part of the kingdom that God's established in our day. And as just like I love that imagery, the stone rolling down the mountain, it's going to hit other rocks and there's going to be like, oh, is it going to make good, make it through? It will and continue to grow. That's the destiny of our church. Now, there also comes a part where Nebuchadnezzar gets a little bit, uh, I don't know, up on himself, a little bit prideful. And it's like, hey, and, and he has some people around that are, that are egging him on. Let's, let's make an, an image. Let's make an idol that looks just like you. And in verse Daniel chapter 3, 11, whoever falleth not down to worship this little idol at the same hour when we appoint it can be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Well, you have a few who won't do it. And three in particular, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they won't. And they tell the king right to his face, we won't do this. Chapter 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are careful to answer thee in this matter. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We don't care what's going on here. If it be so, verse 17, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery burning furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. And this next phrase, I love this next phrase, because they understand faith. They understand, I have faith God can deliver me. And then this phrase, verse 18, but if not. Be it known unto thee, O king, 
that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Elder Dennis E. Simmons gave a great talk on this when he talked about their faith and what we can learn from it. He said this, Centuries ago, Daniel and his young associates were suddenly thrust from security into the world, a world foreign and intimidating. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down and worship the golden image set up by the king, a furious Nebuchadnezzar told them that if they would not worship as commanded, they would immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? The three young men quickly and confidently responded, If it be so, if you cast us in the furnace, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand. That sounds like my eighth grade kind of faith. But then they demonstrated that they fully understood what faith is. They continued, But if not, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. That is a statement of true faith. And Elder Simmons continued, We must have the same faith as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he gives a bunch of examples. Here's some of the examples from his talk. Our God will deliver us from ridicule and persecution. But if not, our God will deliver us from sickness and disease. But if not, he will deliver us from loneliness, depression, or fear. But if not, our God will deliver us from threats, accusations, and security. But if not, he will deliver us from death or impairment of loved ones. But if not, our God will see that we rejoice, that we receive justice and fairness. But if not, he'll make sure that we're loved and recognized. But if not, we will receive a perfect companion and righteous and obedient children. But if not, but if not, we will have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing if we do all we can do, we will in his time and in his way be delivered and receive all that he has. What great faith. And I can just imagine them as their faith is truly tested. And one of the things that sometimes it's a challenge when we study these stories, because we know what's going to go on. We've heard the story. We know how it ends. They didn't. I can imagine them with their faith as they're now bound, as they're now walking to the fiery furnace, as the furnace doors are opened, as they're about ready to get cast in. Their faith is still strong. I know God can deliver me any time, but if not... Chapter 3, verse 19 through 22 says it this way. Then was Nebuchadnezzar fuel, full of fury, and the form of his visage changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Ah, he's popping a blood vessel. Here we go. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And so he commanded the most mighty, a manly man, right, that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. He's going to make sure they do not get away. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats. They want to be protected. They're not dumb. And their other garments. And were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire flew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished. And he rose up in haste. And spake, and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of fire? They answered, and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered, and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of Man. I love the example of their faith. God has the power to protect and to deliver but now I'm going to the fiery furnace of my trial. And for them, they still have the same attitude, whether they burned up there or whether they're delivered. I know God can protect me, but if not, I know it'll happen one day in God's timing. Now, uh, in 1821, John Martin paints this picture of Belshazzar's feast. This is one of the most awesome stories in all the Old Testament. And I try and picture myself there. Here you are having this great old feast, and they're all getting drunk. And when they're getting drunk, I don't know, Belshazzar maybe he wants to impress some people. Hey, pull out 
let's pull out things that maybe other people are uh, considered sacred, but I just want to show it off. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast of thousands of his lords, drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted wine, commanded to bring golden and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then he brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the God of gold and of silver and brass, of iron, wood, and of stone. And come on, this is like one of the classic, this is Rembrandt's 1635 picture, where, I mean, coming out, he sees, all of a sudden, oh, there's his finger writing on the wall. Verse 5, in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed. Come on, this is awesome King James Version of the story. And his thoughts troubled him. So the joints of his loins were loosed. And his knees smote one against another. Holy cow, that's not good. And the, he doesn't know what it means. He calls everybody, what does this mean? And it's kind of like, hey, remember that guy, Daniel? Well, that's verse 10. I'm going to summarize the queen, who's a little bit wiser than the king, says, there's a man, verse 11. He's got the spirit of the holy gods with him. He's understanding. He has wisdom. Nebuchadnezzar, your father, really loved him, helped him out. He's better than all the magicians, end of verse 11, astrologers, Chaldeans, and Chusayers. Verse 12, he has an excellent spirit. He has knowledge, understanding. He interprets dreams. Try him. He'll know. Daniel will know. And on the wall, you have Mine, Mine, Tikal, a parson. Mine, numbered. Mine, numbered. Tiko, which is a shekel. Up harson. Now, Daniel, when he does the interpretation, he changes it just a little bit. So verse 27, Tiko, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Okay, you're numbered. You're not up to par. And Perez, the kingdom, okay, wait, I missed it. God has numbered your kingdom. You're weighed in the balances. You're found wanting. And Paris, your kingdom's divided and given to the Medes and Parisians. And that happens that night. I mean, he's all like, hey, let me give you some gold and some chains and some loot to say thank you. So maybe your God will be all nice to me and uh, maybe I can still stay reigning. But that's not going to happen. So you get, in verse 30, that night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score or 60 and too old, years old. This Darius, just so you know, we don't know who he is. This is from the church's website. It's impossible to identify him with any of the kings of Babylon known to secular history. We just don't know. But he seems to be a believer. He seems to be one that has faith in, in God and believes that Daniel is inspired. And you get that in chapter 6. Once again, we're on video time here. Church has Daniel in the lion's den. It is a great video that, that shows it from a faithful king's perspective. In chapter 6, verse 7, you know, the story, kitten it in here, king, he's got to be cast in the den of lions. Verse 8, king, establish the decree, sign of writing, it be not changed according to the law of the Medes, which altereth not. King Darius signs the writing, the decree, here it is, if anyone asks a petition of any god or man, for 30 days, except for you, king. That's the petition. I don't know what he's thinking, why he signs that. It's very arrogant, but that's what he does. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he waits until, you know, I'm not worried if it, you know, if this is just people trying to influence him, but he waits. Okay, now this is the law. He went to his house and his windows being opened in the chambers towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. I don't care who's watching. I'm still going to have the windows open. And he does faces towards Jerusalem. Now I just do a little pause here on that. There have been people and throughout the Old Testament where they will kneel and pray towards Jerusalem. 
Solomon, in his dedicatory prayer of the temple of Jerusalem, referred to people praying towards the city that thou hast chosen, and towards the house I have built for my name, in 1 Kings chapter 8. Prophet Joseph Smith once counseled the twelve apostles to make yourself acquainted with those men who, like Daniel, pray three times a day towards the house of the Lord. President Wilfred Woodruff, in the dedicatory prayer on the Salt Lake Temple, said, quote, Heavenly Father, when thy people shall not have the opportunity of entering into this holy house to offer their supplications unto thee, and they are oppressed in, and in trouble, surrounded by difficulties, or assailed by temptation, and shall turn their faces towards this thy holy house, and ask thee for deliverance, for help, and for thy power to be extended in their behalf, we beseech thee to look down from thy holy habitation in mercy and tender compassion upon them, and listen to their cries. Now, Elder Talmadge wants to make sure we all know it doesn't matter where you're facing when you pray. He says this in his book, The House of the Lord, quote, These prophets do not suggest that the direction in which one faces when we praise has some mystical significance, but rather that it is an attitude of spiritual facing. To face the temple, which is the temple representation of the house of God, suggests that one turns his heart to the Lord and the covenants made in the temples be more like him. To be more like him, President Wilfer Woodruff clarified this point in what he said next. Or, when thy children of thy people in years to come shall be separated through any cause from this place, and their hearts shall turn in remembrance to the, holy, the promises of the holy temple, and they shall cry unto thee from the depths of their affliction and sorrow to extend relief and deliverance to them, we humbly entreat thee to turn thine ear in mercy to them, hearten their cries, and grant unto them the blessings for which they ask. Really, there is an encouragement to face spiritually our covenants that we made with God, to spiritually face uh, the house of God. Then you got verse 10, king commands, they brought Daniel and cast him in dens of lion. Now the king spake and said to Daniel, thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. I love his just attitude of faith. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the The king sealed it with his own signet and with the signets of his lords. And the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and he passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king rose early in the morning. And by the way, the video, I think, does a great job. Early in the morning. Hey, the law decrees happened. I'm going to sprint. <laughs> and went in haste to the den of lions. And you can picture him, just like the video, or, or like, you know, we've seen it in pictures. There's Daniel in the lion's den. Then the king rose early in the morning, went haste to the den of lions, and when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake, king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel, and has shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. God knows I'm innocent. You do too. 23. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den. And all right, I just love the last part. Maybe this is just me. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and in no matter of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And verse 24, guess who gets to take his place? Ah, no, maybe I shouldn't be happy about that. But okay, just some teaching thoughts. I love that prophecy that the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands. And a day like ours may be a more appropriate time to teach that. This is the destiny of the church. It's going to continue to grow, and one day it will fill the entire world. And that just with our faith, the understanding, God has the ability to deliver us. But if not, we also have our faith that we can accept his will. We can accept what his decisions are that are best for us and the timing in which he gives the blessings. And I love that story. The writing sometimes is on the wall. Well, thanks for spending a few minutes with me today. I hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling.